uh, let me encourage you now to turn your Bibles to Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. We're back in our series in regards to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to finish up probably next week or the week after, and then we will be starting for Sunday mornings a study, expositional study through the book of Daniel. So uh, please be looking forward to that and um, just be prepared. So Luke chapter 24, verse 13, uh, the title of this morning's sermon is The Big Picture of the Bible and Burning Hearts. So the big picture of the Bible and burning hearts. There is a, a book in, in the Mystery on the Desert by, written by author Maria Ritchie. She describes a series of strange lines made by the Nazia people in the plains of Peru some of them covering many square miles. So for years, these people assumed that these lines were remnants of ancient irrigation ditches. But then in 1939, Dr. Paul Kosick of Long Island University discovered that their true meaning could only be seen from high in the air. When viewed from an airplane, these seemingly random lines are enormous drawings of birds, insects, and animals. You know, in a similar way, often people think of the Bible as a series of individual, unconnected stories. But if you're doing a true survey, when you get the big picture of the Bible, the Scripture as a whole, you're going to discover they form one great story of redemption. From the opening scenes of the book of Genesis to the final chapter of the book of Revelation, Weaving through all the diverse strands of the Bible is this overarching story of what God has been up to in rescuing and restoring fallen humankind. From the first nanosecond of creation to the final cry of victory at the end of time, we see God working in history for the salvation of mankind through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at, we're going to read about how understanding the big picture of the Bible caused the hearts of two disciples to burn within them. We're going to see that the risen Christ draws out their thoughts, their thinking, and their faith or lack thereof for those who would follow him. So we're going to look at the two disciples on the road to Emmaus as their hearts get stirred by the big picture of the Bible, all right? So Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13, we'll read to verse 15. It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So here, just to, as a reminder, this is Resurrection Sunday. This is the same day he has risen from the grave. The women had gone and seen that the tomb was empty. Angels told them, look, he is not here. He is risen. Two disciples have run to the, to the uh, burial tomb, and they looked in it, and it was empty. And so this is what's happening. These disciples are leaving Jerusalem after hearing all these stories, and they're on their way home to Emmaus. Jesus appears to them on the road, and he teaches them the big picture concerning himself. So this is perhaps the first reunion with at least these two disciples going home to Emmaus. They're joined by Jesus, and it says that there's three score furlongs away from Jerusalem. Three score furlongs to Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem. So typically, if you take 20 minutes to walk a mile and you multiply that by seven, two to three hour walk here from Jerusalem to Emmaus. That's their distance, but then a discussion ensues. Right? They're talking about the death and the burial of Jesus, the crucifixion, and all the events that have happened in the last three days. They're having a spiritual conversation. Okay? These are believers talking about spiritual things. They're sad. Okay? Let me just encourage you again. If it's not your habit to come to Sunday school, here's a place where you can speak about spiritual things to encourage each other in the faith, to stir each other in the faith, to correct wrong thinking in the faith, because there will be disagreements, to exercise also uh, love and prayer and encouragement, to exercise also uh, preference. You know, we'll agree to disagree, things like that, but encouraging each other in the faith. That's what they're doing on the road here as they're going home, or at least discussing. In fact, God promises a blessing on those who do these things. 
who talk spiritually with each other about the things of God. Listen to Malachi 3.16. A quick application here. It says this, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So God knows when you're speaking about spiritual things, and he is blessed when he hears you talking about him and the things of God. In fact, he tells us to when we're sitting down, when we're rising up, when we're walking, when we lie down, to speak about him and the things of God. We're encouraged to do so. In fact, Hebrews 10, 24 says, look, let's, let's observe one another. Let's, let's look at each other. Let's focus on each other's lives, and let's stir each other up unto love and to good works. That's what's happening here. But they are a little discouraged by the things that they see. They're walking by sight rather than by faith. They are in, as it says there, a kind of darkness, right? Verse 14, And they talked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself was near, drew near, and went with them. And their eyes were holden, according to verse 16. Whether their eyes were holding, it's a, let's look at verse six. Let's read verses sixteen to twenty-one here, as we see Jesus appearing unto them and making some more discussion or asking questions. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him, and he said unto them, "What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as you walk, and are sad?" And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and in word before God and all of the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So here they're walking, a little bit discouraged. And he asks, essentially, look, why are you so sad? What are you talking about? And the reply to Jesus here, you can take it one of two ways. It's either a sarcastic reply or a reply of amazement. You know, it it was incredible to these two disciples that someone had not heard about the events of the past few days. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he would make his defense before King Agrippa, he said, look, look, I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about things that have been hidden. This was not done in a corner. Everybody knows about it. This is a public event. This is a public news situation. Everyone is talking about it. It's almost as if he's saying, what, do you got your head in the sand? You living on a rock somewhere? You don't know about what's going on here? And so they tell him, they tell him what's going on in regards to the death and the burial of Jesus Christ, right? This has dashed their hopes, their dreams about a deliverance of a Messiah and and the pushing off of Roman oppression has now been just crushed because Jesus has died. And the guy who answers, Cleopas, he's one of these two disciples. If you were to read John 19.25, there's a man named Cleopas who's who has a wife named Mary. I think it's these two, but we don't know. These two are going home. You know, one tradition says that the other disciple is Luke himself. You know, we we, we, we don't know the identity of the other disciple, but all we can be sure of is that it wasn't one of the 11. Personally, I think it's, it's Cleopas and his wife Mary. You know, this is another one of those questions that I'll get into heaven and ask, hey, was that you two? But here... They're saying, look, we had hope that Jesus was the prophet, that he would redeem Israel, but now it's too late. He's dead. He's gone. Can't even find the body. They were sad. They were disheartened. Because probably because they sought political redemption rather than spiritual redemption. So when Jesus dies, all hopes of rescue from Roman oppression died with him. So they're down. They are sad. And, and look at verse 19. You know, do, do you notice what it says here? They said that he was a prophet. He isn't anymore. He's gone. He's dead. They didn't believe all the reports that have happened so far. The women went to the tomb. They found it empty. Angels told them that he's not here. He's risen. 
disciples have gone to go look at the tomb. They found the tomb empty, but they couldn't find the body. So as you see here, look at verse 22. Okay, it's been three days since, right, he's been crucified. And verse 22 says, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it so as the women had said, but him they saw not. You know, for a second, they tell him this, this puzzling puzzlement that they have here. They, they, you know, look, some women, they, they went to the tomb, it was empty, an angel told me, like, the, the, the balloon of hope is rising. And that, you know, as you can feel maybe some sense of hope and excitement, and all of a sudden, pop! Some of our apostles went and they saw, and yeah, the tomb was empty, but there was no body. And all of a sudden, that, that, that rising balloon of hope is popped. And so, they're sad. Now look at the rebuke Jesus has. Look at verse 25 here. Then, then he said unto them, Oh, fools. Right? Oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses in all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So we see here the rebuke by Jesus. Look, their ignorance of the scriptures here, he, he points that out. He says, look, fools don't believe. You've forgotten the prophecies concerning the death and the resurrection of the Messiah. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to look or enter into his glory? You know, this would have been the perfect time to say, Look at, my na- look at the, 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 the nail holes in my hand here. You know, he could have said that right then, but what does he do? He draws them out, helping them to think through what they've done. In speaking about his res- resurrection here, he didn't show them the prints of the nails in his hands. He points them to what they should have their hope in. The scriptures. Right? He doesn't point to the physical. He, he, he points to the spiritual word, the written word. He says, essentially, you should have believed what the prophets said about me. You know, it, it's important here that, that Jesus, you, you notice his focus and his attention. Go back to the word. That's the attitude you should have. You're a fool if you don't believe it. He gave a unanimous and a wholehearted accepted of the Bible statements. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're a fool if you don't believe the word. And we see his interpretation of the scripture there in verses 24 to 27. He, rev- he, he reviews for them the Old Testament passages which speak of him. It says, he expounded unto them. The, 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 this is, he explained it thoroughly. He opened it up to them. He interpreted the key passages and themes in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now imagine this, a two to three hour walk and Bible study discussion. And at that point in time, there was only Old Testament written word or inspired scripture. So he's going over Genesis to Malachi. He's going over certain themes. And let me just suggest to you some possible themes. Let's go back to Genesis 3.15, perhaps he says. God promised a redeemer, a deliverer, a champion. One that would be crushed by the serpent, or the serpent would strike his heel and he would crush the serpent. So the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. Yes, the serpent shall strike, which is what happened at the cross. But the servant, the seed of the woman, shall crush his head. So there. Maybe that's one theme. Another one, Genesis 22. He probably says, remember Abraham was told to offer his one and only true son on the altar of sacrifice? God didn't allow him to go through with it, but my father allowed it to go through with me. I am the substitute. I am the Lamb of God. Maybe a survey of all the sacrificial animals 
in the Old Testament. Abel's sacrifice was better than Cain's. That better sacrifice was a blood sacrifice. That was me. That pictured me. The Passover sacrifice, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. That points to me as well. All the Levitical sacrifices, all the tabernacle ceremonies, the Day of Atonement, they all point to me and what would happen with the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. The serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness, that all people who were struck by the the serpent of sin should look and live That's a picture of me too. The suffering servant in Isaiah 52 and 53, I think he spent a lot of time there. That speaks of me as well. The prophetic passages of Psalm 22 and Psalm 69, that's me as well. What they had missed was this, that the Bible is not a series of unconnected stories. The big picture of the Bible, the key to understanding the Bible is to see Jesus Christ on every page. He didn't teach them only doctrine or only prophecy. He taught them all things concerning himself. And their hearts were so stirred, they asked him to come home with them and have dinner. They didn't even know. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of humor here, right? Here's, here's this stranger saying, what things? What's happening? Right? It's not that he didn't know. They didn't even know that the stranger was Jesus himself. All they knew that while they were talking to him and he was opening up the scriptures to to them on their way home to Emmaus, that their hearts started to feel strangely warm, started to burn within them. But the truth is, these two disciples could have walked and talked for days and never have gotten rid of their depression or disappointment. Why? Because they lacked the key. They lacked the key to understand or unlock the Old Testament that the chosen one, the Messiah, must suffer first before he enters into his glory. The cross has to come before the crown and the kingdom. Their hearts burned as they heard him teach the scriptures, and soon these mourners would become missionaries. And so I ask you the question here, has your heart grown cold to spiritual things, to this here, his communication, his love letter, his written word, the graphe, the written word of God? Do you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you this truth? Let me give you a quick survey of the books of the Old Testament. It stirred my heart to even think of these things. Right? It's possible that he said, in the book of Genesis, that speaks about the seed of the woman, that's me. In the book of Exodus, it speaks of the Passover lamb, that's me. In the book of Leviticus, it talks about atoning sacrifice, that's me. In the book of Numbers, it talks about the bronze servant that was lifted up in the wilderness, that's me. In the book of Deuteronomy, it promises a prophet, one like Moses, that's me. In the book of Joshua, it speaks about the unseen captain of the Lord's host, that's me. In Judges, it speaks about a deliverer, my deliverer, that's me. In in Ruth, It talks about a related, a kinsman redeemer. That's me. In Samuel, in Kings, in Chronicles, it looks upon the promised king. That's me. In Ezra and Nehemiah, the one who would restore the nation. That's me. In Esther, it speaks about my advocate. In Job, it speaks about my redeemer. In the book of Psalms, it speaks about my all in all. That's me. In Proverbs, it speaks about my pattern for wise and, wise and skillful living. That's me. In Ecclesiastes, it speaks about my goal. In the Song of Solomon, it speaks about my beloved. In all the major and the minor prophets, it speaks about the coming Prince of Peace. That's me. In Matthew, Jesus, King of Kings. In Mark, Jesus, Servant of Man. In Luke, Jesus, Son of Man. In John, Jesus, Son of God. In the book of Acts, Jesus ascending and then sending. In the letters, in the epistles, Jesus indwelling and filling and empowering to do 
In the book of Revelation, that's me returning and reigning. Get the big picture of the Bible. It'll warm your heart. Let's finish. Let's finish the text here. Verse 28. And they drew nigh unto the village. So after two and a half, three hours of Jesus opening up the scriptures, they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as, as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. So we see the recognition of Jesus here. The, the, the guest becomes the host. We see the meal and the invitation. The word constrained here. They constrained Jesus to join them for a meal. There's a forcefulness here. There is, I insist that you stay, that you remain. I insist. And here's a principle that you need to understand if you want blessing. Jesus does not force himself into their home. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and let me in, I will come in and dine or sup with him and he with me. Look, if you want your heart stirred, if you want true peace and rest, you have to let him in. And there is a forcefulness to it, an insistence. Come in. Be a part of my life. You've given me the bread of life. I want it. And he reveals as he prays there, and he distributes the bread. At that very moment, whether it was supernatural or natural, when he says, you know, as he's done before, if these disciples were who I think they are, You know, in the cultural setting, bread was not sliced, but it was broken. Break the bread. We sung the song. Break thou the bread of life, Lord, unto me. They didn't recognize him, whether because of his physical deformity, because of the beatings and the crucifixion, whether it was supernatural blindness or unrecognition of him. I think it was a little bit of both. When he, I think he lifts his hands, Lord, God of heaven and earth, supplier of all good things, he reveals the nails in his hands. It's him. The nuances of the way he prayed to his heavenly father, they probably recognized it as Jesus had done the same type or pattern of prayer before. And then they realize it's him. And then then we know supernatural happened next. They're gone. I mean, he's gone. They're there. Here's a principle I think that we can draw from this. Those who entertain Jesus will be well entertained. Those who open up their homes to him, their hearts to him, he will open their eyes. He won't force it. But then we see the miracle. He suddenly disappears out of their sight. He vanishes, and wow. Look at verse 32. After a seven-mile walk, perhaps, a two-to-half, three-hour journey, they decide to go back, right? They double their trip in one day. Look what it says in verse 32. And they said one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared uh, unto Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. So they think about their visit with Jesus. They think, they meditate, they reflect. Didn't our hearts burn? Wasn't our hearts warmed 
as he, as he opened up the scriptures. And again, they turn from mourners to missionaries, and they, they, they return to Jerusalem, report all that has happened to them, and they hear the news from the others. Do you see how, you know the scripture reading that was read this morning about Jacob and wrestling with the angel of God or the Lord? And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. That same type of attitude and, and intensity of desire is when they said, stay with us, come in. We invite you in. That same type of intensity that we find in the prayer of the Psalms where God says to you, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. There has to be a strength of desire. There has to be a desire to do something for God or to receive something from God. And God opens up his word, he warms your heart, and he changes your life. You had to have two things here. Jesus said this, he said, O oh, fools and slow to believe all that the prophets have said. You have to have faith in the word of God. And you have to have a desire for Jesus to walk and to sup, to, to, to dine, to, to be with you that you might receive the word. And that desire, that understanding of the big picture of the Bible will warm your heart and change your life. We close with this last story, an illustration about how someone received that word and a culture was changed. Because the Bible can change not only a life, but an entire lifestyle. Most of us have heard of the story of the mutiny on the bounty. Okay, but few of us have heard of how the Bible played a very vital part in that historical event. The Bounty was a British ship which set sail from England in 1787, bound for the South Seas. The idea was that those on board would spend time among the islands, transplanting fruit-bearing and, and food-bearing trees, and doing other things to make some of the islands more habitable. After 10 months of voyage, the bounty arrived safely at its destination, and for six months, the officers and the crew gave themselves to the duties placed upon them by their government. So here's their task, and they're getting it done. When the special task was completed, however, and the order came to embark again, the sailors rebelled. They had formed strong attachments for the native girls, and the climate and the ease of the South Sea Island life was much to their liking. The result was mutiny on the bounty, and the sailors placed Captain Bly and a few loyal men adrift in an open boat. Captain Bly, in almost a miraculous fashion, survived the ordeal, was rescued, and eventually arrived home in London to tell his story. So an expedition was launched to punish the mutineers, and in due time, 14 of them were captured and paid the penalty under British law. But nine of the men had gone to another distant island. There they formed a colony. Perhaps there's never been a more degraded and debauched social life than that of this colony. They learned to distill whiskey from a native plant, and the whiskey, as usual, along with other habits, led to their ruin. Disease and murder took the lives of all the native men, and all but one of the white men named Alexander Smith. He found himself the only man on an island surrounded by a crowd of women and interracial children. Alexander Smith found a Bible among the possessions of a dead sailor. The book was new to him. He had never read it before. He sat down and he read it through. He believed it and began to appropriate it. He wanted others to share in the benefits of this book, so he taught classes to the women and to the children as he read to them and taught them the scriptures. It was 20 years before a ship ever found that island. And when it did, a miniature utopia was discovered. The people were living in decency, prosperity, harmony, and peace. There was nothing of crime, disease, immorality, insanity, or illiteracy. How was it accomplished? By the reading, the believing, and the appropriating of the word of God. Would you be able to explain to somebody from the books of Moses that they point to Jesus? 
I mean, if Jesus asked you that question, or if I asked you or somebody else, tell me what the Old Testament says about Jesus. Could you tell them from Moses and all the prophets what it means? That's what Jesus did with these two disciples here to Emmaus. He explained how the Old Testament, the only inspired scriptures in existence at the time, he explained how they foretold of a coming Messiah who would suffer and rise again. No other book covered more about the suffering of the servant Savior, the suffering Savior, than the book of Isaiah. Again, I think I spent, he spent a lot of time in Isaiah 52 and 53. But the truth is, as you grow in your understanding and, and laying hold of, of the Scripture, it can lead to having a, a big head, right? Proud. But when you receive the Bible when you walk with the Savior as well, that should stir your heart and lead to a changed life. One of the marks of true salvation is that your heart has been changed, your appetite, your hunger for the things of this world are no longer the same as it was before you came to Christ. I read something recently that, you know, it encouraged me because I hate growing old. <laughs> Right. I turned 50, you know, I, I, I hate, you know, at 30, I could play basketball. At 35, I could play basketball and still feel it three or four days later. And one of the things that I read recently was, look, God allows us to grow old and wear away so that we don't long for the things of this world anymore. What we should long for and hunger after is the word of God in fellowship with his son. When the spirit takes the word and he opens the eyes and the hearts of men, you see it. There is a change and your heart burns for the word of God. You hunger after truth and righteousness. And so I ask you the question, has your heart grown cold due to neglect of the word? Or has your heart grown cold because of sin? Let me encourage you this new year, this set of new beginnings. Make it a point to spend time in the Word of God. Make it a point to understand the big picture of the Bible. It will help you. The more you receive the Word of God, the more you will want to fellowship with the God of the Word. We sang about it today in Break Thou the Bread of Life. Remember these lines? Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. Let's pray. Please bow with me. And, and as the pianist plays a tune of invitation, let me ask you, do you understand the big picture of the Bible? Do you realize that understanding all that God has done through his word can warm, warm your heart because of his love for you. So let me encourage you to learn the word. Get an understanding of the big picture of the Bible. We have an opportunity for you on Sunday evenings beginning next week to understand that big picture. To put all the stories, the unconnected stories together in that one great theme. God sent his son to be the savior of the world. Do you have someone to talk to one-on-one -on -one about spiritual things or in a small group setting about spiritual things, about the Word of God? If you don't, talk to me. We'll assign you a spiritual mentor. We'll help you to grow in knowledge, in the understanding of the Bible. You can get down, you can get depressed if you don't understand truth like these two disciples were. In the age and in the times that we live in our nation, you can get down and depressed and worried and anxious. But I say to you the same thing that Jesus said, O oh, fools, and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He is risen he is still King of kings and Lord of lords, and nothing happens without his permission.
be encouraged when you know the word. Look and live through the word, the written word, and the living word, Jesus Christ himself. And in this new year, let me encourage you. There are people. There is opportunity. People are living in fear. People are enclosed in their homes. There is great opportunity for believers to do as Jesus did to reach others. You can walk with them. Not for the entire journey. You can walk with them for a little part of your life and their life as Jesus did here. You can talk with them. You can bring up spiritual matters. You can bring the word of God to bear in their circumstance, in national circumstance. Open the scriptures that the spirit of God can help them understand that he is risen and he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Share a meal. Share a life. Bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, it is in you that we hope and move and have our being. Lord, it is in you that we trust and that we live. Help us to understand all that you've done in the scripture to save us. And then stir us up, warm up our hearts to tell others about the great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. For it is in his name we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. Please take it to heart. Grow in your knowledge of the word of God and your heart will be stirred. And then let me encourage you, do something for God this year. God bless you. We'll see you next week.